So let's talk about footnotes. Footnotes are an integral part of academic writing. And the reason for that is that research is supposed to be science. And science is evidence-based. And of course, different disciplines and different fields have their own preferences. So in the natural sciences, there are one kinds of footnotes. In social sciences, there are other kinds. And in the humanities, there's yet another tradition. But even within the humanities, there can be different formats, depending on your subfield. So what you really need to do is to follow the preferences or the standards in your own subfield. And there's a little booklet called The Footnote by Anthony Grafton. It's an interesting idea to write a whole book about something so small as a footnote. And this is an interesting book. It's well worth reading it, although it's not really about the footnote. But the title, of course, is fantastic. So what are the footnotes? Why do we use them? In academic prose today, they're really a way to organize your material and also to indicate levels of hierarchy. If I read something in a footnote, I know it's related to the main text, but maybe not as relevant to be included in the main text. So it's kind of added at the bottom of the page or if we're using ad notes at the end of the article. It's not on the same level of hierarchy as the narrative in the main text. Rather, it supplements it or provides some context. Overall, footnotes make reading academic text more interesting and also easier. Okay, but why? Well, I can see several reasons for this. Number one is that it organizes knowledge through hierarchies. Number two is that it also has a navigational function. It's signposting connections and hierarchies and alerts the reader to the structure of the paper, thereby makes it easier for the reader to navigate through the text. And number three, that it provides evidence in the form of references. And so it makes the paper more trustworthy and authentic. Adding footnotes also makes the paper much more interesting for the reader and also for the writer because I love adding them. I love adding some information which is not directly relevant, which is not of the same importance as what I'm talking about in the main text. So, for example, occasionally we see undergraduate students' papers without footnotes. And this is a leftover from high school years where they had to write essays and kind of think about things rather than building an argument in the form of an academic paper. And so we always instruct them to add footnotes and teach them how to do it because footnotes are just part of the genre. This is how academic papers function. They have footnotes, they have an introduction, they have conclusions and so forth. So there are different formats. There's the short form and there's the long form. The short form is when you have a bibliography and you only refer to the items in the bibliography using the surname and the date. And technically speaking, this doesn't make any difference. You can use the long form or the short form, whichever works for you best. If you're writing a PhD dissertation, you might have to economize on word count. And sometimes the bibliography doesn't count towards the word count. And then if you use a short form, you may gain as much as 10% extra in terms of how much words you can add into a dissertation. And of course, every journal has its own standards, so you have to accommodate that. You have to see what they require and then go with that. And in this video, I wanted to take a moment and elaborate on the ideal footnote. And this is, of course, subjective. This is what I consider an ideal footnote, which is kind of my own personal opinion. But it's also the result of my own background and the field that I work in, which is geared towards literary and philological approaches rather than sort of the social sciences approach. Generally speaking, for me, the footnote does the following things. Number one, it references the sources precisely. It may also include some information on those sources, and such additional information might make a dry reference much more interesting. Number two is to provide additional information that helps to understand the main text. Typically, these would be details that are not relevant enough to go into the main text, but are still relevant enough to be included in the article because they provide context. And number three is to provide signposts that help the reader to understand the structure of the paper and, by extension, the line of thought of the author. And to be honest, I also like when the footnotes provide a parallel narrative to the main text. So the reader doesn't just read the main text, but also has a number of other things in his peripheral field of vision. And so that helps him to have a richer and deeper understanding of the main point in the article. 
So I really don't like footnotes, which consist of a list of long references, like a list of names with dates, because they carry no story. To me, referencing scholarship is kind of 25% of the footnotes function. These kind of lists of dry references to a bunch of things in the bibliography are actually distracting rather than providing value. I don't want to have too much information that distracts me from reading the main text or in extreme cases actually makes it difficult to read the main text. Like when you have really long footnotes that stretch over several pages and have multiple paragraphs and even tables in them. There's definitely such a thing as the right balance between the main text and the information in the footnotes. And the paper that achieves this right balance is much more enjoyable to read and I guess I also learn more from it. I retain more of it. Like designers, they often talk about the right balance on a page or on a web page or something. And apparently it really makes a difference in how people or users react to an ad or a web page. It's important from the perspective of user engagement. If there's too much information, users simply learn to not see it. This, of course, might be different in different cultures because Chinese web pages or apps, for example, they have way more information than what we're used to in the West. And I think the same way as on an advertisement or a web page, it's important to have the right balance. It's also important to have this kind of balance in an academic paper. You get a better result in terms of user engagement or reader engagement. It's just that we don't talk about this much or think it's not important. But I do think that it's possible to do footnotes elegantly and that leads to better results. That makes the paper better. And when I'm writing a paper, footnotes actually also have another function for me. They help me organize my thoughts because I could think of something that's relevant, but then I don't want to distract myself by interrupting my main line of thought. And so I can quickly put this thought in a footnote and leave it there for a time. And then I can keep adding information to it. And once I think there is enough information in it to take it out of the footnote and put it as a paragraph into the main text, then I do that. But when it's in the footnote, it's actually much easier for me to add to it because I somehow feel that it's less important. And so I'm not constrained so much by this desire to write well. I just write what I want to write and I don't care how it sounds or feels. And when I think that this paragraph of information is good enough, this is when I lift it and put it in the main text. And at that point, I kind of rewrite it and make it better. So while writing in the footnote, I can focus on what I want to say rather than how I'm saying it. And so this way of writing in the footnotes for me provides a very practical solution to writer's block and procrastination because adding to a footnote seems much less important and much easier to do. The stakes are much, much lower. And because of that, it's easier to write. And come to think of it, footnotes also have a very useful function when you're trying to finish papers. Because when you're finalizing your paper, you're usually left with a bunch of unfinished footnotes with missing dates and page numbers. And as you progressively fill in the missing data, you're left with the ones that are much more difficult to provide. And you need to use interlibrary loan or visit the archives again in a different country or different city and so forth. So the last footnotes are really, really difficult to finish. And if you think of it, in many cases, you can just delete them and your paper will not suffer significantly. You lose a few juicy details, but in reality, these tiny bits of information may not be detracting from your main argument. And so what I'm saying is that the function of footnotes at this stage of writing is that they help you finish because if you delete them, you're done. And sometimes you don't have to delete the whole footnote, just rephrase it in a way that you do not have to add that particular bit of information. So I see sacrificing the last batch of footnotes as a fast track to finishing a paper. So if it hasn't been clear so far, I really like footnotes. And I love this quote by Joanna Russ, who said, I once asked a young dissertation writer whether her suddenly grayed hair was due to ill health or personal tragedy. She answered, it was the footnotes. I also commonly hear grad students talking about footnotes in this way, like they spend three, four days writing a single footnote or being totally exhausted by this process of footnoting a paper. And I think this is a completely wrong approach. You should like the footnotes. They are your friend. They help you to write. They help your reader to read what you write. 
Okay, so let me know what your experience has been with footnotes. Please write in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and see you next time.